Hi guys, this is Unit 4's set of video notes. We are going to start out with just an introductory facilitation of sensation and perception, and then we'll move even further into breaking down each one of the five senses and talk about how we go about perceptually organizing and interpreting various different stimuli that are presented to us on a daily basis. So, where this unit is concerned, well, our focus will be is sensation and perception. Okay, how do we essentially construct or create an understanding of the external world around us? So, for example, your ability to see me right now, to hear me right now, um, to, to go about taking down notes as we complete these activities throughout the unit. Um, all of these are ways that we are attempting to take in information and represent the world around us. In order to really be able to do this, we have to have the capability of detecting physical stimuli in the world around us. And so the detection of that stimuli in our environment is called sensation, okay? So we take what we are presented with, it's turned into neural signals in our brain, and so that is our experience of sensation. Now, perception, on the other hand, is slightly different because perception is reliant on our ability to experience sensation in order to organize and basically just develop an understanding or interpretation of our sensory processes. So there's our differentiation between those two because oftentimes kids can get them confused. One way that we go about attempting to detect the physical world around us and to process it uh, and essentially combine the processes of sensation and perception together is bottom-up processing. In this scenario, we basically just do exactly as it says. We'll take an analyst, we'll take an analysis of the stimulus that is presented to us uh, with our sensory receptors, and then we will work on building up to processing that in a more general level. So we look at the specific parts first and then bring it out to the whole. So an example of bottom up processing would be being able to differentiate from these options right here which one is the American flag. Obviously, after your senses take in all of those colors, they look at the shapes of things, they'll be able to recognize um, which one of these is in fact the American flag, and in order to do that, it went from small pieces out to the larger whole to recognize this one would not work, this one would not work, neither would that, that, or that. And so by completing bottom-up processing, we're able to differentiate in those kinds of um, in those kinds of scenarios. Opposite to this is top-down processing. So this is when we take things from a more generalized whole, a bigger picture, and we break them down into smaller uh, understandings based on our experiences and our expectations of things. I'd like you to pause this right now and try to figure out what it is that this is saying, okay? Because there's something that enables you to be able to, after a little bit of, of thought process here, construct a perception and an expectation of what this is um, because of your higher level mental processes. So, pause it, and then when you're ready, keep going. You'll notice that it says you can read this sentence with every third letter missing. So, we have the ability for our brain to fill in gaps for us in order to be able to perceive and to establish higher level thinking for us. We can make inferences there of what we think the letters should be. And the reasoning behind that is our top-down processing ability. In order to really make sense of complexity, oftentimes bottom-up and top-down processing are going to work together with one another to sort through complex images. So let's take a look at this, for example. This picture, you can see quite a bit of foliage, there's trees everywhere, there's a guy with two horses. But then once you know that the forest has eyes is the title of it, and you start to take a look at it, you'll start to notice that there are facial recognizers within this image. You can see a face here, eyes, nose, mouth. There's a face right here with eyes. There's a profile face right here. You can see down here in the rocks, there are eyes right there, a large nose, mouth fairly prominent. You can see an eye right here. There is a face within these tree branches. And so 
we're able to, through bottom-up and top-down processing, to take a look at these smaller pieces, to organize them as a whole, and to recognize the more complex imagery that's going on within this picture. Another thing to keep in mind for yourself when you are thinking about the whole experience of sensation and perception are thresholds. Two very important thresholds that you need to make yourself aware of. The first is something called absolute threshold. This is the minimum stimulation that we need in order for our senses to detect a piece of stimulus 50% of the time. Okay, So, for example, our ability to detect sugar within um, iced tea 50% of the time, the minimum amount of that would be the absolute threshold. Uh, the minima, minimum amount of sensation to experience a bee sting, that would be our absolute threshold for that experience. Or to even just feel the bee on our arm. Sometimes we can have, you know, a fly or a bee or some kind of insect, um, you know, crawling on our arm or on our leg or something along those lines. And more often than not, we're not necessarily able to notice that it's there until we've detected a certain amount of stimuli. Another example of absolute threshold would be when you put your hand over the flame of a candle. You experience as you go through that, as you get closer and closer and closer, a noticeable difference in terms of your detection of that stimuli. So your absolute threshold then would be that minimum point where your hand gets closer to being able to feel the heat from that candle. On the other end of this, we have difference threshold, or the just noticeable difference, JND. So these are both two terms you need to know for vocab. Difference threshold is the minimum difference between two stimuli in order to make it possible for us to experience that stimuli 50% of the time. So this is what we refer to when we say the just noticeable difference. So the minimum amount example of um, sound change in terms of increasing the volume for you to be able to hear it. Uh, that's essentially what this little image here provides in terms of an example. So, within just noticeable difference, we have Weber's law. Heinrich Weber is a German who established this law in the mid-1800s, believe it or not, and he studied it on weightlifting. Not something you would typically think of for 1800, uh, for life in the 1800s, but Weber determined that the size of a just noticeable difference, that difference between two stimuli to detect it 50% of the time, is proportional to the intensity of the stimulus. So by that we mean if the stimulus intensity is high, then your JND is going to be fairly large. So it takes a bigger increase to notice the difference. If the stimulus intensity is low, that means that your just noticeable difference is going to be smaller because it takes less of an increase to notice the difference. So, for example, if you went from doing a small little five pound hand weight and then you went to lifting a very large uh, barbell full of 50 pound weights, that's a large increase. The intensity of that has gotten bigger, so you have a large just noticeable difference. If, however, you stayed with just your little hand weights here, and you just bumped yourself up to an 8-pound hand weight as opposed to the 5, the stimulus intensity there is kind of low, so your just noticeable difference would be low there as well. Now, subliminal threshold is our ability to uh, detect stimuli below the absolute threshold. So essentially what we're looking at here is conscious awareness of pieces of stimuli. Where a subliminal threshold is concerned, you don't have conscious awareness typically. It is possible for some scenarios to be present where people will notice these items, uh, but typically they're not. They're presented below your absolute threshold, so you don't consciously make yourself aware of them when they're presented. So essentially what these are are subliminal messages. Much of American pop culture has a tendency to focus in on this whole concept of that subliminal messages can influence your buying habits, your voting preferences, and so we'll go through a few examples of this right now. Back in the 1990s, uh, Pepsi got in a little bit of a, a hot water, if you will, because they were trying a new kind of branding way of getting Pepsi's name out there, and so they did these cool can designs to get people to buy Pepsi. 
It was a big point in time when the cola wars were going on between Pepsi and Coke. Now, as part of this promotional campaign, they created four different kinds of designs for these cans. If you look here with this kind of neon can, interestingly enough, some people became very aware and kind of offended and appalled by the fact that if you were to stack these cans one on top of one another, supposedly there is a very inappropriate subliminal message. It has S here, E here, and X down here. So if you put these two cans together, supposedly there was this subliminal message, this very inappropriate message that Pepsi was bringing across. Another example of this was in 2004 during the election between John Kerry and George W. Bush. What happened in this situation was Tom Bin, a company that produces computer bags, briefcases, messenger bags, things like that. They're made in Seattle. Any kind of cloth uh, good that is produced in the United States has to have on it, you know, machine washable and just in care instructions in general. In these instructions, in French, there's a part right down here at the bottom, just here, where if translated to English, it says, we're sorry our president is an idiot. We didn't vote for him. So this came out right after the 2004 election. And so there was a lot of, you know, uproar over this whole situation because people thought that this was a slam against George W. Bush. Supposedly what Tom Bin's CEO said was that it was a joke between himself and the seamstress uh, I, and a seamstress for that company. So another kind of example of this where subliminal messages are concerned is back masking. It became kind of popular with classic rock music. Um, some of you are familiar, for example, with the whole concept of um, 1966 Revolver, Beatles album. They basically recorded sound backwards onto a track and then it was ended up played forward. Okay, the whole reasoning behind it, it's, you know, a current technique right now to try to get rid of like inappropriate um, pieces of songs in popular music right now. They'll use it to kind of um, make it so that way they can be put on the radio, turn it clean, for example. And uh, so this was kind of started and popularized by the Beatles in the 60s. In the 80s, interestingly enough, there was this really big controversy because a lot of people came out and they were completely convinced, particularly Christian groups, that these were being used by musicians to further satanic messages in their music. And some people became quite um, angry about all of this and petitioned to the federal government to get involved. Whether backmasking exists, uh, you know, with regard to like these subliminal messages is obviously up for debate. Um, but it can be used to have an effect on listeners and kind of cue you into certain experiences. Um, basically what we refer to that is priming in that regard.